have you put a scripture on the screen so we can see it with our eyes this morning. We're singing about underneath the power of our great God, talking about every knee bowing. We're talking about darkness bowing its knee. And it's a powerful thing to sing. But how do things bow their knee? How do things change? It really is by words, words of God that came from his mouth towards you. He gave us some promises. I want to read this, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 through 4. We're going to start here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. It talks about grace, God's grace being multiplied, God's peace, His completeness being multiplied to you. 2 Peter 1, verse 2. Grace and wholeness, completeness be multiplied to you. How many of you not just barely get along, but multiplication of uh, an abundance and abounding multiplied to you like God it's just being just shoveled upon you this is what it says to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ by which let's see this next verse as his divine power has given us all things that pertain so this power we're talking about underneath the power of our great God we're talking about be, darkness bowing its knee we're talking about grace and peace being multiplied to you his power has given us all things that you need for life and your life in him God, and life in God through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue next verse tells us how he says by which he has given to us exceeding great and precious promises these promises, His promises to you, the promise of dark, the, the, the darkness leaving is because you hold a promise in your heart. And not only do you hold a promise in your heart, but He's keeping His word and watching over it to perform it. That through these, through what? These promises, you may be a partaker. You can ha- you receive what His divine nature and escape all the corruption that is in this world. It's a powerful, this is a powerful set of verses here. That God has given you and me promises for our children, promises for our body, promises for our mind, promises for everything you face in life. As I, as I was, as we were singing that song, I, I, I thought, sometimes we don't know what promise to grab and I grabbed my phone and I grabbed our, our app, our Beyond Church app. And if you go on to the Connect Center, there's a thing that says resources. And on the resources, there's all these different, these different things that we have. One of them is this, help. Help for when you don't know. You know, that's, that's what I find is the darkness that comes is when you and I don't know. And it, I clicked on that, help for when you don't know. And I found out that For when you fear and worry, there's all these scriptures here. Mom, when you're afraid, Dad, when you're afraid for fear and worry, there's all these promises here. When you need healing in your body, wow, there's all these promises just right here. When you're struggling to walk in love or receive love, there's a promises of God's love. There's what about who God says about you when you feel like you're just... who you are, what he says about you. What about when you need some strength? What about for your mind? What about when you need wisdom and guidance? What about when you need financial or material needs and you're struggling to figure out how to... Well, there's promises just right there. So, Father, we just thank you this morning for your promises to fill our hearts. Lord, we're asking you for your words to be bigger, that we would grab a hold of those and that you would grab the other end and bring into this place grace and peace to these lives multiplied to us a multiplication of grace, strength, power, and just peace. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. Whole families in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Grab a chair this morning. Thank you, Lord. Happy Mother's Day. It's, man, I'll tell you, Mother's Day 
is a wonderful day. There's nothing like a mama's love. I'm able to look through and care for. How many of you know that's probably one of the hardest things there is? I know for a guy, he's just to continually just care for and do the things that so many times get overlooked. Um, and there's a strength that's, and that comes out of love. Those hard things, those patient things. It's mama's love. So, uh, hey, a couple announcements before we uh, uh, before we do our <clears throat> receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Um, uh, Want to give you the first one would be this. Hey, starting point. Um, I guess I could do if you're new here. Hey, welcome if you're new here. Um, we're, I'm Pastor Nate. Glad to have you. Um, Man, it's a good weekend, right? But anyway, if you're a uh, starting point, if you're new here, uh, one of the ways that we just find out a little bit more about the church uh, is we have this starting point. It's again, it's, uh, you can go on our website or if you download or Beyond Church app, uh, it's right there. And there's just what it is is it's some videos, uh, some short videos, multiple short videos to let you know who we are, maybe some doctrine things, and uh, just the youth, uh, our youth ministry here, our children's ministry, also some things that would help you in your walk with Christ, just some basic. Basics. Our heart is more than anything is that you would you would grow in, in, and fulfill the destiny or the reason for which God created you. Sometimes we get stuck in just coming to church, but but you're we're not just in a sense a number, like we're 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 an individual, and God has a destiny for you, and you find that as you discover who He is, you'll find that He who He's created you to be, and you'll be able to put those gifts into play. Uh, and at work for your life. So anyway, starting point, jump in, uh, jump that in there if you want to find out a little bit more about who we are and get plugged in. Uh, di- daily Bible reading. We're in Acts, Acts, Acts 6, uh, and today's ketchup, you know, not to be confused with mustard. This weekend is, that's terrible. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Lord. Um, but no, this is, every weekend is a ketchup weekend, and um, it, we're, in other words, five days a week, we read through the whole uh, New Testament in a year, and we've been reading in Proverbs, and so the Proverbs just says on rotation, on rotation, a book of wisdom. This is a year, where if we'll walk in wisdom, the Bible talks about, you know, some in a house of wisdom, there's there's long life. In a house of wisdom, there's riches. In a house of wisdom, there's peace. In a house of wisdom, guess what? There's a whole family in a house of wisdom, and so uh, we're reading Proverbs every, uh, you know, over and over and again. It's about 10 times this year, but Acts chapter 6, jump in. Man, I really believe Christians should read their Bible, you know, and not just hear what a pastor says about it, but it's full of life. It's full of life. So jump on uh, that. It's on the app. You can always just jump in and see where the plan is. And then <clears throat> this coming uh, two weeks from today, we have a Memorial Day picnic. This is always one of my favorite times of the year, mostly because of turtle races, right? And you're like, what the heck is turtle races? Well, we started the turtle races a couple a couple years ago at a Memorial Day uh, church picnic that we had at our house, and um, and we're going to be doing turtle races again. Except for this year, rather than having blow ups and and ponds, we're going to go. We're going to run out the water park. Um, it was available that weekend, so we were excited, like, hey, let's go to the water park. And but we're still going to do the turtle races, and we're going to barbecue beforehand, bring some sides, and. Um, anyway, 6.30 to 9, really 6 to 9, um, not 6.30, that, that's actually wrong, so 6 to 9, uh, we're going to start eating around 6, and then 7 to 9, the water park is rented out. So, hey, turtles are crossing the road all the time right now, so moms and dads, this is a great day, to you know, great two weeks to grab that turtle, build a little home for it, and save it, paint the number on the top, it's the cutest thing last year, somebody used sticky tack, a toothpick, and a little flag, and they numbered their turtle. It's so cool. Anyway, and we have prizes for the turtle winners. Dad, Mom, you can enter too, not just the kids if you want your turtle, but just get some turtles, and we put them in this ring, and then they, they race. Anyway, it's, it's the highlight of my year, honestly. So uh, come be a part of that if you didn't have Memorial Day plans, or if you, um, we're going to have church like regular uh, on Memorial Day uh, weekend morning, and then kids can get a nap, and then Dad can get a nap, and we can come and barbecue and have some fun. Belly flop, right? All right. Um, and then uh, one thing, this last, last Wednesday night, we had bingo night. How many of you are here for bingo night? Yeah? That's so awesome. Bingo night was great. Cakes sold good. Cookies sold good. They tasted good. Um, but they had a purpose. 
And that purpose was ultimately the whole night was about uh, helping send a, a, a kids to camp, youth camp and children's camp. And we raised over, drum roll please, $13,000. And every dollar, every dime, every penny of that goes to, uh, to bring the cost of camp down to send kids uh, to camp. So we just throw that and divide it out and send it into ki- all, the, all the, the kids that are signed up to go to camp. And it would be a blessing and to sow into their spiritual lives, their destinies. How many of you know you're getting in on the beginning of a destiny? That's a special thing, special thing. So uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to take a moment to receive our tithes and offerings. And, and Pastor Evan's going to be ministering this morning. Uh, I believe on the love of God in our whole family series. Um, but this morning, I, I wanted to take just a moment and, and, uh, and receive our tithes and offerings, maybe a little longer than normal. Um, and that's uh, sometimes we're, we're, when it's time to give, <clears throat> we give and we're thinking just dollars. You know, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So we know that your treasure is a locator of the heart. But there's also another locator of the heart. This is what we're going to talk about this morning, just for a moment. Because, and that's our words. The Bible tells us that in Proverbs, it talks about our words are the locator. Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. And, and, and do you know that you and I, can, we can give dollars, and the Bible says that that locates our heart. But did you know words also locate our heart? And there's something else that we're to be giving to God when we come into His house, and when we sit before Him, and that's Glory. That's we're to be giving God praise. We're going to be magnifying Him. We're to be giving Him uh, praise for what He's doing, what He's done, for His promises. And we're to hold faith in our hearts. So I wanted to talk this morning. There's actually four verses we're going to just click through. And we're going to give God glory, not just a dollar this morning. As we give, we're going to give Him glory. We're going to talk about what He is doing. What, and so I wanted to go through um, a, few, a, a little bit right here. Um, Actually, that would be uh, the five verses if we included that one there. But Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. This is a, a, a passage. It says this. It talks about the size of our faith. Okay? And it says this. He replied, because you have so little faith. So let me give you this, the, the setup here. There's a scenario where the disciples are trusting and trying to do what God told them they are to do. Anybody trying to do life right now and trying to do what God told you to do? Anybody from their heart trying to apply what they know to do? Anybody? I mean, I think everybody here is trying, but so many times we fall short of what we're trying to do, and we're struggling, and then what sets in is questions and fears and torment and not measuring up and all of this kind of stuff and what's happening here is the Lord had told them to cast out demons go but they couldn't do it on this one and what happened is this demon made a show when they spoke to it and commanded it to come out it made a show how many of you know sometimes when you're standing on the word of God or you're standing on a promise of God it says this but it sure looks like this It looks completely different than what the Word says. And so what it does is it causes you and I to back off of what God said we could have or said we could do. We back away because of what we see. And this is, a, this is so huge in our finances. This is so huge in our lives. So we, we back away from what God said because of what we see. And this is the, this is the scenario right here. And Jesus says... He answers them, why, why could we not cast it out? He says, because you have little faith. Because you have little faith. Now, we know also that as you go on, he says, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, that's pretty small. So do they have just absolutely no faith? No, no, no. Little there t- refers to how long you're willing to hold on to what he said. How long are you willing to hold on to what he said. The Bible tells us don't grow weary in well-doing because in due time you will harvest if you faint not. The Bible talks about his word being like a seed. He says that so many times it's just choked out. It wasn't a problem with the seed. It was choked out by the cares of this world or it was picked up because uh, by the enemy because it had no root or it dried up because it had no root. He said no, because of your little faith you've only held on for a little while if you hold on longer 
He said, because if you hold on longer, the, the seed, the mustard seed, the faith, the promise will do the work. He said, it, it'll do the impossible for you. What you can't do, the Word can do if you hold on to the Word instead of keeping your eyes on something else. So that's scripture number one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 tells us this. It says, now this is, not might be, could be, hope to be, this is. Now this is uh, the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Did you know faith is what you and you and I choose to partner with God's Word? Your faith. It's not it's not faith. It's personal. God's promises are personal. He's, and it, it doesn't say that the victory could be. No, it's a promise. This is the victory that you need in this world. Faith. Faith. A promise from the Lord for your children. A promise from the Lord for your, over your mind. A promise from the Lord. And guess what? It'll bring victory. It'll bring victory into your life. That's what the Bible says. Let's, let's go to the next, the next passage, Romans chapter 4. So how do you hold on a little longer? Because that's probably the struggle, isn't it? Don't you, aren't you thankful that God started? This is the, all of our fathers. How many of you know it's Mother's Day? But it's important that, that to look at the scripture not just as the father, but a mother as well. This is Sarah and Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. It says this, so without weakening in his faith or letting go of his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. He, he faced that fact. Let's keep going here. Yet he did not waver through unbelief. So what does that mean? He didn't let go of the promise. Yeah, I see this is true, but, I, but this is the promise that I have. I see this is true, but this is the promise that I have regarding the promise of God. He didn't let up. He, he didn't let go. He, he held to. It's what Jesus did when he cast out that demon. He spoke to it, and the demon spoke up all the louder, and Jesus said, um, excuse me, come again. I'm not moving. You're moving. The mountain's moving. The mountain's moving. Somebody needs to say that this morning. The mountain's moving. Because I got a promise of God. But instead was strengthened in his faith. So you know what that means? That he was holding on, but now he's strengthened to hold longer. How is he strengthened? Gave glory to God. God, I give you praise. Thank you, Lord. This is a lot of what praise sounds like. Lord, thank you that you meet all my needs according to your riches and glory. I know that this is going on. I know that this is going on. I'm not denying those facts. But I'm, but I'm putting my trust and my confidence in your word. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your promise. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you're causing all things to work together for good. Thank you for favor. Thank you for a multiplication. Thank you for whatever it might be. I'm telling you, there's promise for you. Next verse. <clears throat> it is written, I believed. This is 2 Corinthians, so not, this is not in Romans. We jumped, we jumped. He says, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since I believe, therefore, or, or since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe, therefore we speak. This is so important as we give God glory. You can't give God praise without opening your mouth. You can't give him glory. And what's amazing is the Bible tells us that our words, our mouths are like a rudder. And if you and I want to hold on to faith, if you and I want to hold on and not just have little faith, short faith, but be there for the promise, we're going to have to learn to use our mouth, which will turn our eyes. It's amazing how my mouth turns my body, it turns my head, it turns and it turns my eyes. And when I look at, I talk about. What I look at, I talk about. So I just wanted this morning, as we, as we give, we're going to give God glory. We're, as we give our tithes and offerings, we give them as a worship. But the, one, of the, one of the things we worship, the Lord says, if you're going to worship, worship in spirit and in truth. He looks at the heart. He looks at, at that. Let's not just only say, oh, well, we're just going to give some money here. No, let's give God all of, let's make sure that our words and our, our, both our, our, our acknowledging him as who he is unlimited 
a promise that pertains. We just read that, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 and 4 through 4. He's given you a promise. He's given us a promise. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we just give you glory this morning. We say you're, you are big enough. You're strong enough. Father, you're good enough. We thank you that the promise is you came to us with a promise. You came to us. And you even told us concerning care. You said, give me that care. Because I'll care for you. Lord, this morning we cast cares on you. We just, we just cast cares on you. We say, oh Lord, thank you for taking that and caring for that for me. Thank you for taking that and caring for that child. Thank you for caring for that and caring for our house and our well-being and our future. Lord, thank you for that. We, we give that to you and we take your word. If, Lord, if we're, if we're needing a promise, I'm asking you, we're, we're, we're asking you for your word, your promise this morning. Your promise to be to be given to us. Holy Spirit, bring it to our our path. Bring it to our remembrance. Show us in your word what you said concerning every one of our days and our futures. Hope. Hope in this house. Hope in these hearts. Hope in these eyes. Hope in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. We commit these tithes and these offerings, Lord, to your work, to your service. We thank you. We lift them to you, even just a multiplication. And I thank you that you said that you rebuke the devourer. And you'd open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that there's not even room enough to contain. Lord, that's your word. We give you glory for that. Windows of heaven opened. Just another, just it's right here. It's just right there. The windows of heaven opened into, into, into homes, opened into lives. Exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask, think, hope, or imagine. Thank you, Lord. We give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Go ahead and give this morning. Well, we have Pastor Evan going to be ministering this morning as it was coming into Mother's Day. She's like, I want to minister to moms this morning. And so can we have all the moms stand before we, uh, before we move on? And we're going to just pray a blessing over you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for moms this morning. Not just moms as a word, but Father, for the gift that they are to so many lives of faithfulness to stand. Lord, we're just asking right now for you to fill their hearts and for them to know their value. Valued by you. Celebrated by you. Gifts from heaven. Tailored for each and every one of them today. For promises that they've stood on to be brought about, to be able to walk in fruit, and just to go with joy and strength in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. We bless you. We bless you. Take it away. I got my wife's mic. I thought I had a little reverb this morning. And uh, so, yeah, she. All right. Thank you. Well, are you glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. I'm believing for strength in my voice, okay? (laughs) So you can believe with me. All right, well, we are. We're going to talk on um, the love of God. And as I was just praying and seeking the Lord for this service, um, 
really the word that came to me is um, forgiveness. So we're going to hit on that a little bit. But, you know, you really can't talk about forgiveness unless you talk about the love of God. The love of God is what enables us to um, walk in forgiveness. And, you know, it was so cool because um, the worship team we had um, practiced this uh, past Thursday night. And um, with in talking with April and stuff, and she just had texted me earlier in the week when we were going over the worship set, and she said something about uh, the last song, There is Power. And you know that the very last part of that song says, in the name of Jesus, there is healing. In the name of Jesus, there is freedom. And that phrase just so stuck out to me, and she kind of mentioned, you know, if we need to flow with that for a little bit with healing. And man, when she said that, it just went off on me because this was really what I saw for today is healing's going to take place. Healing's going to take place. And we're going to um, talk along the lines of the love of God and just really um, what holding on to unforgiveness, what holding on to bitterness um, does, does, it affects your body physically. And so there's a lot of people and I've, I've seen it before. I've seen ministers talk about it with um, people that, you know, they don't necessarily have to come up and get hands laid on them. Once they receive the word on how much they're loved, on how much they've been forgiven, and they choose to forgive that person that maybe they've held on to something for years, the healing manifests in their body from simply just coming under that commandment of love and forgiveness. So I just believe that this morning... That as the word comes forth, that healing's going to manifest. Amen. And so we may kind of have the team come up a little bit. We'll see how we um, flow there. But I just saw that for just to make some heart adjustments. And you know, for some of you, you may think I'm fine. I don't. I'm pretty good at forgiving. I don't. I don't need to forgive. Well, you'll face a moment in your life when you're going to need to forgive. We all do. Right, And sometimes it can be easier than other times. But I just believe, um, yeah, like I said, healing is going to take place today. Amen? So can we expect that this morning? Okay, so we're going to start here in John 13, 33 through 35. And we have quite a bit of scripture this morning. But how many of you know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God? And so I just want to encourage us this morning... um, to hear the word with fresh eyes, fresh ears, and not to um, think, oh, I know the topic on the love of God. Or, oh, I know this verse, I've heard that before. And we would all be silly to think, I've been there before, where someone's speaking on something, or maybe even the Lord is showing me something, and I'm like, Lord, I've heard that before. And we can become just so familiar with stuff, and what happens then is there's no faith there, and we don't receive from it. So if we want to receive from it, we have to hear this morning that his word is life and it's to me. And there's something in it every time I open up the word, every time I hear it, there is something God is wanting to say to me. Amen. So John um, 13, 33 through 35 says, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to you, The Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so I just want to highlight this this morning, that um, part of that vision statement, preaching Jesus, everyone, everywhere, every day, some of the greatest ways that we can preach Jesus and that it says what? That others will know that you're my disciples is if we have what? Not just love for people out there. It doesn't say that here. What does it say? That we have love for one another. And you know, sometimes, especially we're still in this whole family series and, um, you know, Sometimes the hardest people to love are the ones that we're with more. You know why? Because we're familiar. We think that, you know, have you ever been where it's like, you know, if someone else was around, you wouldn't have lost it like that? Have you ever noticed that? Maybe your kids or your spouse or someone, something does 
someone, someone does something. And you have people over at your house, and it's just like, if they weren't here, I would. <laughs> You're lucky they're here right now. But you know what? Those moments, it shouldn't matter who's around. Why? Because we have the love of God on the inside of us. Okay, Romans 5.5 5 says this. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So aren't you thankful that the love of God has been poured out in your heart? It's not your own natural love. It's a divine heavenly love that's been poured out in your heart. And I love, I love that um, word, poured out. Guess what that means? You're not lacking in love. It's been poured out to you. 1 John 4, 15 through 16 says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Aren't you thankful for that? And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So what do we see here? God just doesn't act in love. God is love. He is that love. So the kind of love God is, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Um, John 13, 34 says this, that a new commandment I've given that you love one another. So how many of you know sometimes we can hear that word commandment and we don't like it so much? Or we can just kind of skim over that. But how many of you know he's given us the commandment to love? That means if we are following him, we are to obey what he's asked us to do. And he does not command us to do something that he doesn't enable us. Aren't you thankful? So sometimes we hear the commandment of love and God's commanding us to love. But it's not from our own natural ability to love because we fall short. But how many of you know, and we've all been there before, where you want to react in a situation, you want to do something, and that love of God is just constraining you? It's telling you to hold back. It's telling you to forgive. It's telling you to bless. It's telling you to love. What is that? That's not your natural flesh. That's the love of God in you. Amen? And how many of you know, in our families, love is so important? Love is so important. To have a healthy family, to have a healthy flow, we have to have the love of God in our homes. And that's not to say that we're perfect. (laughs) We all mess up. But aren't you thankful that he forgives us, he cleanses us and washes us? And love is something, we're going to talk about this in a moment, but love is something we grow in. We're to cultivate and grow. It's been put there. But how many of you know, I I think I talked about my garden, I don't remember when it was or who I was sharing it with, but we planted asparagus, and if you know about asparagus, asparagus starts like super teeny tiny, and asparagus isn't something that you enjoy the first year and hardly the second year. Really, it's years three and on where if you grow it, you're able to harvest it. So guess what that means you have to do for the first couple years? You have to tend it. You have to weed it. So I could say that that asparagus has been put in the ground there. I planted it. And I would be silly to think if I never tend it, if I never weed it, if I never fertilize it, if it never gets sunshine, if it never gets water, if I'm not watching over it and tending it, I would be silly to go, well, why is it? I planted it. It's been put there. Why is it not working? Well, what would everyone say? Well, silly, you got to attend it. You have to do something. And how many of you know the love of God's been put in our hearts? It's there. I don't have to work it up. I don't have to, but I do have to cultivate it. I do have to tend it. I do have to watch over it in order for that love to flourish and to grow. And how many of you know love in Galatians 5? It tells us that love is a fruit of the Spirit. And how many of you know I don't get fruit just because I want fruit? And I don't get fruit just because I plant an apple tree. I get fruit because I plant it, it's in the right conditions, it's in the right soil, and I tend it. 
Well, the same is true with the love of God. It, it's there, but we have to grow and, and tend it, and we have to exercise it. That means what? I can't just know that I need to forgive someone. I have to actually exercise that and do it. And then what happens when I forgive that person? The love of God grows in me. And then you know what? The next time it's a little bit easier. Or we could say believing the best about someone. You may struggle in that area. Well, you know what? You ask the Lord to help you, but then you have to put action to that. And when thoughts want to come contrary to not believing the best about a person, you're going to have to exercise your faith. You're going to have to exercise that love muscle. Because how many of you know, when you were born again, your spirit was made new, but your body and your flesh is still your body and your flesh. What does it say that we're to crucify our flesh, crucify our body? We're to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable and pleasing to him. That means that this flesh wants to try to dominate. And, you know, we used to do this in um, Sunday school. It was like the little three-part man. And this is what I would call just a Bible basic that helps you so much when you understand you're a three-part being. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. And just like anything else in life, the more I sow to the spirit, I'm going to reap of the spirit. The more I sow to the flesh, I'm going to reap of the flesh. So if I want my spirit, the love of God that's in there, to dominate and and to live from that place, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to sow to it. I'm going to have to exercise it. How many of you know you don't just get big muscles because you want them? You don't just get fit or lose weight because you want to. I mean, I could ask that question in here. How many of you want to lose weight or get fit? And a lot of hands would go up. There's a difference between I want to and I want to get to that place and then what you have to do to actually get there. And what does it take? It takes discipline. It takes doing some exercise. It takes saying no to your flesh in some areas. Well, the same is true spiritually. We can't expect to be somewhere if we're never sowing to our spirit. If we're just constantly feeding our flesh and allowing our flesh to dominate, allowing our flesh to make decisions, well, I want this, so it's going to be this way. Well, I'm just a whatever personality, so I just tell it like it is. Well, I just that that flesh that's being flesh dominated. You may tend to lean that way, but you don't have to. You can you can grow out of that. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to stay fleshy? I almost taught on that too. Childlike versus childish. We are to be childlike. We're not to be childish. So there's some things that as we grow up spiritually that are supposed to fall off of us. And the Bible talks about now because you walk in the spirit, now because you're dominated this way, let that fall off. In other words, the more I grow with him, the more I begin to look like him, the more that stuff falls off. I don't have to try to make it fall off. It just falls off. The same with your body. When you exercise, when you eat right, you're not trying to make it fall off, the weight. What happens? It just starts to fall off because you're exercising. You're working. Well, the same is true with our love walk. We have to exercise it. But aren't you thankful? Again, I'm not saying it's in our own ability to do it. But there is action to our faith. Okay. Um, Let's read this, Romans 13, 7 through 10. It says, Render therefore to all their due taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So what's this saying? You can take all of the Ten Commandments... This is what he was saying. 
You can take all of the Ten Commandments and you can put them underneath the commandment of love the Lord your God and love one another, and all of those Ten Commandments will be fulfilled there. So this is what our command is as a born-again believer. Love God, love others. Now it sounds simple. But you know what? The temptation comes to be offended at God, to be offended at people. The temptation comes to all of us, doesn't it? But we have the choice. Aren't you thankful? The enemy can never steal your choice. The enemy can never steal your choice. You have full authority of what you choose and don't choose. You know, that saying, well, they made me do that. Well, they just made me. I, if I wasn't raised like that, I would be, uh, uh, stop. You have a choice. The enemy wants to convince you that it's someone else's fault. It's someone else's. You have a choice in what you choose in your life. So this is something that um, we see here, that the only debt I owe is to love someone else. That's the, that's the debt that I owe, is I owe love to other people. Amen. So before I say something, before we say something, this is a great question to ask ourselves. How is this going to affect the other person? How is what I'm about to say, how is what I'm about to do, or not do, or not say, affect someone else? Because love works no ill. Love isn't trying to get even. Love isn't trying to say, well, pff, glad. you know, you hear about something, well, I'm glad because they just really had that coming. We got to stop ourselves. Love works no ill. Love wants to see people succeed. Love wants to see people flourish. And we've all had the temptation if there's, you know, something that takes place in a relationship or in things and you hear something and your flesh will say, good. Your flesh is going to say that because it's your flesh. But you know what's going to come up after that? The love of God that says, no, that's not good. Well, we have a choice then. What am I, what am I going to do? Am I going to be thankful for their demise? Or am I going to let the love of God step in and say, no, you know what? I, I call them blessed. What is it? We have a choice. Let's look at 1 John uh, 3.14. And it says this, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Well, what's this saying? If I choose to not love somebody, I am choosing to remove myself under, from under God's covering, out from under that blessing, out from under his provision, out from under him into a place of death. Outside of love, you are on a road to death. Amen. Amen. And, you know, we don't like to hear that, but it's true. If we step outside of love, we step outside of God's protection. We step outside of his provision. And we'll see this. It affects, your, it affects you mentally. It will affect you physically. We're not meant to harbor unforgiveness. We're not meant to harbor wrong thoughts toward people. So he didn't say here that the love of God has been shed abroad in your body and flesh. You still have the same flesh. We talked about that, didn't we? It's been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. So Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, you present, say that, I present, my body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what do we see here? We see a couple things. That I am to present my body as a living sacrifice to God. Guess what that means? Sacrifice. That means I have to sacrifice. It, it hurts. In order to walk in love, guess what it's going to do? Really, 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 really hurt your flesh. Your flesh is actually going to be screaming. Have you ever been there before? I have. Plenty of times where your flesh is just like, you know, you want to type something out on Facebook and then delete it just so your flesh can feel good. <laughs> or thoughts that you think and you go down a road in your thought life, well, I'll never do that, but dangerous. We're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. What is that? What God wants. Lord, my body is yours. My mind is yours. I give it to you. How do you want me to act in this situation? How, what do you want me to do in this situation? And then whatever he tells you to do, you do that. And then it says this, and don't be conformed to this world. How many of you know the world can't love because they don't have the love of God in them? So if I'm conforming to the world, I'm going to be further and further away from love. Because that's how the world acts. They can only go so far in love. You know, they talk about it, self-love and love, and, but it's a twisted form of love. It's not the God kind of love. They can't act in love if that love hasn't been shed abroad in their heart. But when we receive Jesus, we've received that love of God where we're able to love other people. But what do we have to do? Just like we said, our spirit's made new, but our mind and our flesh is not. This is why, you know, Pastor Nate talked about the daily Bible reading. This is why it's so important to have time in the Word. Because the Word, actually, when you read the Word, it changes the way you think. It changes your mind. Where you begin to operate from a different level and from a different place because of the Word of God. And it says that it transforms you. Isn't it amazing? You know, I always think when I read this verse of a caterpillar. And you think of a caterpillar, a little grub. Not very pretty. But a little grub. And what does it do? It transforms over a period of time in the cocoon. And then it comes out. And what is it? A totally different creature. A beautiful creature. Well, we can liken that to the love of God at work in us. When we begin to conform our mind... And, the, and let that word work in us. Let that word and begin to exercise the word, which means what? When I read the word, I don't just hear it. What does it say? If I just am a hearer of the word, I deceive myself. But if I'm a hearer and a doer of the word, that's how I grow. And so when I hear the word and begin to do the word, it actually transforms me into something beautiful where I begin to look more and more like Jesus. Okay, so let's take a look here at the love chapter, and we're going to read this out of the um, Amplified. So how many of you want to have a successful life? Only a couple hands. How, let's ask that again. How many of you want a successful life? How many of you want a successful marriage? Even if you're not married yet, in your future, you want a successful marriage. How many of you want a successful family? Okay, well, we're going to read right now how to do it. Okay? Because at the very end of this chapter, it tells us this. Love never fails. And I want to encourage you. Don't look to the natural to determine if love's working. We're not to look at what we see in the natural. Don't look to the natural to tell if love is working. I have to have faith in this promise that his love never fails. When I love my spouse with the God kind of love, that love never fails. When I love my children with the God kind of love, that love never fails. 
Okay, so 1 Corinthians um, 13, and we'll read, um, can we just do 4, four through 8? It says this, love endures long. And I want you to just hear this and picture this. This is the very love that you have on the inside of you. And you know what helps me is to know when I read this love chapter, this is the love that God has for me. First, we have to understand when we read love endures long and is patient and kind, this is who God is to me. And when I know that this is who he is to me, I can be that to others. So it says this, love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily, is not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. It's not rude or unmannerly. It does not act unbecomingly. Love, and then it says in parentheses, God's love in us, does not insist on its own right or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. So in our marriage and in my family, when I come in and say, bet, 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 tell me, how does that go for you? That's just like taking a match and just, Right? Well, I'm having it my way because da 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 da. That's not love. And you know what? Guarantee you, if you're born again and you take a moment to listen, the Holy Spirit's going to be scratching you saying, stop, stop, stop. And you know what keeps us from not stopping? Pride. Well, I'm just all the way there, so bless God, I'm just going to keep on going. Why? Because our flesh likes it. Truly. When you're on a tangent and when you're on, your flesh likes it because it's your flesh. But the Holy Spirit's in there like, stop. And you know what you can do mid-sentence? Stop. And you can say, you know what? I'm sorry. That wasn't the right way to do it. And if you have to go to another room to cool off for a minute, that's okay. It's better than spewing. It's better to let the love of God constrain you until you can get his heart for the situation, his heart for the person, his heart for your coworker, his heart for your spouse. Okay, um, it's not self-seeking, which means it doesn't always have to be my way for it to be good. I can prefer someone else once in a while. It's not touchy. This is a big one especially for females. <laughs> females, we, we like to talk. We like, you know, the emotions and stuff, but it's not touchy. It's not touchy. Someone sh- shouldn't look at you wrong and it causes you to go into a tizzy. It's not touchy. A coworker frustrates you and then you go to your other five co-workers it's not touchy love knows how to restrain itself love knows honestly when to keep our mouths shut when to not say something when to not get into all of the drama that's going on and you know what spiritually mature people know when to be quiet So it's not touchy, it's not fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays, I love this, pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Did you know what so-and-so did to so-and-so? Do you know what so-and-so did to me? Do you know how my husband talked to me? Can you just believe it? Do you know what my kids have been doing lately? If you want to stay in that, and you want to mull around in that, but you know what? There's a way to come up higher. There's a way to come up above that. The enemy wants to draw you in. Like I said, what? Your flesh likes that, but your spirit on the inside is like, no, no, no. Stop, stop, stop. Why? Because he wants to lead you to life. 
Okay. Um, it does not rejoice in injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. I mean, that alone right there. I am ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. It endures everything without weakening. Ooh, that one right there. It endures without weakening. You know what? You can keep on loving. I didn't hear a lot of amens, but it's true. (laughs) You can keep on loving because God's love in you is not weak. God's love in you is strong. You're able to do it. Even if it's years and years and years, it's not weak. It's strong. Love never fails never fades out or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. And aren't you thankful for that? That his love in us and through us never, ever, ever fails. Just say that. His love love. never never fails. Amen. So we saw this, Galatians 5.22, and we talked about this a little bit, but that the fruit of the Spirit is love. So the first fruit that we see demonstrated is love. So let's ask ourselves this question. What have I done or what am I doing with the God kind of love that abides in my heart? Have I developed and practiced it? Did you know you can practice love? You can work love? Just like we talked about, it's like a faith muscle. How many of you have ever, like, lifted free weights before? And maybe you start, you know, you're doing curls. Okay, and I'm a lady, so guys don't laugh. But, like, if you start with, like, eight pounds or something, right? And you can do it, and then it's like you reach a point where it's like, I can't do it anymore. Or have you ever done push-ups to where you just can't do it anymore? And, like, physically, it's funny. But, like, my mind will be like, you can do it. And my body's like, no, you can't. And, And you just can't do it anymore right? Your body just gives up. That's it for the day. But then the next day or a couple days later, what can you do? You can up it by a few. Why? Because your muscles grew. Well, the same is true with our love walk. We can grow and begin to grow in our love walk. We should look back from a few years ago and be able to see that we've grown in our love, our love for God and our love for others. That those petty little things that used to hold us or keep us in our families, in our marriages, with friends and relationships, that's not holding us anymore because I'm growing. I'm putting into practice love. So the love of God in your heart won't be developed unless you exercise it. And guess what? Other people help us exercise it. What do, they, what, what do they say? Like, if I'm by myself, I'm like, man, I'm really good. Yeah. But when I get around other people, I'm like, I really need some help. Yeah. Right? But you know what's awesome is God knew we'd be with other people. And, and God made each and every person different. Different ways of thinking. Different, totally different. But that doesn't mean that we can't love people. It doesn't mean we can't get along with people. You know, you can get along with anyone and everyone, and we should. I'm not saying you have to be best buddies with them, but I am saying the love of God for people should flow out of us. So um, the love of God won't constrain you unless you let it constrain you. It doesn't just work automatically. You have a part to play in whether or not God's love ever grows and develops in your life. So we hear about this often, the love of God, the love of God, and we read the love chapter, but then we just, but we have to put it into practice. So love grows when it's cultivated. In the same way that farmers have to nourish the seeds they've planted for their crop to grow, we must care for the love God has planted in our hearts so that it will grow. And once we sow that love into other people's lives, we must still watch over and cultivate it for it to produce a harvest. 
So to grow in the love of God, we must think and act in line with love. And Philippians 4, 8 tells us the way love thinks. So let's see that. You must replace the negative with the positive. You do that by immersing yourself in God's word. For example, every time you see someone who's wronged you, does everyone in here have someone who's wronged you? Raise your hand. We all do, right? So when you see someone who's wronged you, instead of thinking badly about them, think on the good. Instead of that thinking of what that person did to hurt you, remember what the Bible says. Great peace have they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to be easily offended? We can look at someone who's hurt us and offended us and frustrated us, and truly, I'm not saying it's overnight, but I am saying the more you practice it, truly your heart will begin to change for that person. So here's what I want to say and how I, I've done this in my own life with people who may have hurt me or said things about you that weren't true. And I remember one time going through something and it was a pretty big deal and I wanted to just justify myself and say, no, that's not true, that there, it's lies, it's lies, it's lies. And I remember almost audibly, I remember where I was in our old house in my kitchen and I heard the Lord say, I am your defender. Don't say a word. My job is to love them and to pray for them and to get my heart healed and to get my heart in the right place. My job isn't to try to, I can forgive before someone ever apologizes. That's why it's called forgive. It means it goes ahead. God already forgave you when he sent Jesus ahead of your sin. So if I'm acting the God way, the God way forgives ahead. That means I may be best friends with someone. That means I may, we may be getting along great and down the road something happens. Well, guess what? I already need to know forgiveness is down the road. That, that's how God acts. That's how God loves. And it's not within me. It's within him. But what do I have to do? In that moment, my flesh was like, I want to do something. I want to defend myself. I want to say something. It's not true. But you know what? The love of God in me said, hold it. I'm your defender. And you know, he spoke to me. And sometimes we think, yeah, you're my defender. You're going to get him, God. You hear that, right? Well, he's my defender. He's just going to zap him. Again, flesh, which is what I thought. Yeah, you're my defender, God. That's right. And he stopped me again. That's not how I defend. You know how he defends love. And so what did I have to do? I had to exercise. I had to put it into practice, which means when my flesh wants to do something or not do something, I have to do what God's love is telling me to do. Because why? What did we see? Love never fails. Okay. Um, so gardens, like we talked about, my little asparagus out there, I weeded it. And guess what? It's time to weed it yet again. Our whole garden. I almost actually took a picture to show what happens when you do not tend your garden. So we're going to get out and tend it. But this is what, this is, it, weeds spring up easily. In our lives, things spring up easily that want to cause us to step out of love. But you know what? If we just keep in the word, keep listening to the Holy Spirit when he prompts us, keep a tender heart. You know, one of the worst things that we can do, and I, I've talked to our staff, I've talked to our leaders about this, is because we're called to love people, we have to love openly and freely, which means this, there is going to be hurt. In, in your family, there's going to be things that people say to you or do to you that hurts. Whether it's, you know, parents to children, children to parents, to spouses, to in-laws, to cousins, to whatever, 
right? There's going to be things that hurt. And we have to know how to let the love of God heal that hurt. Because here's, here's what the enemy wants to do, in, whether it's with your spouse, with a friend, with your children, whatever, relationships. He wants you to say, because of something in the past, now I'm stepping into something, you know, a relationship with someone else, but he'll remind you of what happened the last time with this other person. So you know what that's going to cause you to do? Put up a wall. And say, well, I'll let them in, but I just won't let them in so far. And so I've, I've talked to our leaders and, and people about this. People are going to hurt you. It's just, it's just how it is. But we have to know how to let God heal us and how to be able to love so freely and openly again. Think about God. Think about how people reject God. Yet he still loves so all the time, so 100 million percent. This is how we have to be with our spouses, our children, all of that, is love fully and openly. Let God heal you and not barricade. You can't, like, compartmentalize your heart. Either your heart's tender and healthy or there's barriers. There's, there's a wall there of hardness of saying, I'm just not going to let that in. I'm not going to allow that. I'm not going to. You have to be able to let the love of God heal that so you can love freely. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so don't give up if the only sign of love you see is a little seedling. Okay? That's good. We can rejoice with that. I got so happy when I was weeding my little asparagus. And let me tell you, it was weedy. Like, I was on my hands and knees. You can ask Caleb. He was out there with me. I was on my hands and knees, like, literally peeling apart, like, I'll demonstrate. <laughs> like this close to the ground, trying to find my asparagus. Okay? Because some of it's like, like pencil thin, lead, lead pencil thin. Okay? I accidentally ripped one up, and I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> but little seedlings. But you know what I saw there? I was excited because I know what's going to be produced. So I just want to encourage you, don't be hard on yourself. When the love of God is working and it's a little thing and it was a big deal, thank you, Lord. It's like a little seed. The love of God's working. And why, why is that exciting? Because I know I'm growing. And I know years down the road when I keep doing this, my love will be bigger. And I'll get a harvest of the fruit of love. Okay. Okay. So we're going to just look here at um, just a couple things of um, ways that, um, well, let's just talk here. We're going to just talk for just a moment on forgiveness because this is so, so key. Love and forgiveness go hand in hand. You cannot say that you're walking in love if you're holding ill or, or a grudge or ought in your heart towards someone else. Then you're not walking in love. And we want to convince ourselves sometimes that, oh, it's not that big of a deal. They just kind of annoy me. It's okay. Eh, that's a big deal. Because guess what? The enemy will be sure to continue to feed that. And then it's not just going to be that person. It's going to be that other person. And then before you know it, it's a big, why? Because it's like a weed that's not tended to. What happens to a weed that's not tended to? I can't just look in my garden and go, oh, it's no big deal just a little weed. I'm going to come out two weeks later and it's going to be a big deal. So the enemy wants to convince us that little thoughts that we think, little stuff that we have in here, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, it's not like you want to kill them or anything. It's a big deal. It's a weed that we have to pull out. So... Forgiveness and bitterness can become roots. Okay, so talking about gardening again. We've, we've had a garden, and there's some weeds that the little roots, it's like so easy to pull up. And then there's other ones where they look easy to pull up. And you go over and you're like, <laughs> and it's not coming up. And I'm like, Nate, Matthew, Samuel, someone, come pull this weed up. 
Why? Because its roots have gotten. This is bitterness. This is unforgiveness. If we allow it, it will be rooty. And the rootier it gets, the more hold it has on us. So this is why it's so important to release people. Let them go. It's like that song. Let it go. Let it go. Right? And why can I do that? Because of the love of God. When I realize how much I've been forgiven, when I realize the debt that I owed, I can forgive. So one way we put love, God's love into practice and exercise it is to forgive. Love must be exercised. Okay, Ephesians 4.32 says this, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted. I love that. You know, it's interesting. It says tenderhearted before forgiving one another. You know why? Because anytime there's unforgiveness, it's hard. It's a hard heart. It's a hardened place. But right before this, it says that you be tenderhearted. For forgiveness to come, you you have to tender your heart, tenderize it. Well, how do we do that? With the love of God, with giving over to the love of God. And when I am tenderhearted, I can forgive. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. So we forgive whether people forgive us or not. Whether they apologize or not. Whether they say they were wrong or not. Because God is love and love forgives. Um, Hebrews 10.17 says, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So guess what? God is saying the sins of you, the sins of what you've done, I don't remember it anymore. So if we're operating in the God kind of love... The kind of love that forgives also forgets. If I'm truly operating in the love of God, it means I'm not holding it over that person years later. If I forgive, I forget because that's how God operates. And you can do that because God's love is in you. So God furnishes the love for you and I to forgive with. And like we talked about, if you go by your flesh, your head, your feelings, that is a mistake. And it will always lead you down a wrong path. But if you tap your heart, if you tap what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do, it will always lead you to love. Always. If there's something there that's telling you to retaliate, if there's something there that's telling you to just say it like it is, or you got to tap again because the love of God will tell you to be kind. The love of God will think of the other person. Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Sounds like another command, doesn't it? That we must do it. We must forgive. So we're going to see what... um, When we're not walking in love, when we're walking in unforgiveness... How many of you know it actually hinders things? And we deceive ourselves if we think we're walking around it and around with it and it doesn't affect us. It affects us. So let's look at some ways that this can affect us. So unforgiveness or not walking in love, holding on to a grudge, holding on to something, it can hinder our prayer life. Okay, let's look. Mark 11, 23 um, through 25. It says this, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And we're always like, woohoo! I can speak to the mountain and tell it to go. I, whatever I ask can be done for me, but let's look at the hinge point here. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, 
that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. So what do we see here? In order for me to have the word work for me, I need to first check, is there anything? This is a, this is a great thing to do every day. Because how many of you know, today may be fine, but tomorrow someone may do something that frustrates you. Specifically, if we're talking about whole families, you're with them a lot. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to say something, do something, something not go right. But can I just say, I'm just going to take a side tangent for a second. It is so important to um, guard your home with strife. And don't give it a moment. Don't give it a moment. So if there's something that goes on, you know, like we talked about earlier, you can stop it right then. And you know what? You can come together and you can say, in the name of Jesus, we're not having strife in this home. We're not having this. Don't give it even a foothold. And here's why this is so important. It's important to train your children in this and for you, you to do it as a family because when they have their families, they'll see strife is not something you want to mess around with. Because what does the Bible tell us? It's an open door for every evil work. And what is simply strife? Um, Proverbs talks about where strife originates is through pride. So if pride is in play, strife, will, that's where it starts. And really, that's what strife is, right? Because it's, it's trying to up the other person. It's trying to, that, that's where it originates. So I just want to encourage you, and maybe we'll talk about this in our family series. I feel like we always do, but it's so important. This is why healthy families deal with strife immediately. Don't even give it a foothold. What does it say? Don't let, let the sun go down on your wrath. Because when we leave space for the enemy... You know, I remember when um, Joe talked a few weeks back on communication, and you leave space there, he will eat your lunch. He, will, he is the accuser of the brethren. What does that mean? If, I, if there's strife and there's stuff, it's opening the door to the devil. But then you know what? The accuser's coming in and to my husband, to my children, to whoever the, the strife is involved with. He is the accuser, so he's going to come, and he's going to feed you lots of lies. Because you know what? He can't speak truth. So he's going to come, and he's going to throw lies, throw lies, throw lies. And you know what it's going to do? If you let it, it'll cause unforgiveness in your heart. It'll cause bitterness. It'll cause those roots to begin to grow, which is why you have to stop it. And you have to say, you know what, I'm sorry. We shouldn't have responded like that. I'm sorry for the words that I said. And you have to have your kids hug and apologize. Have them, like, don't leave it. Don't leave it. And the whole cold shoulder thing, don't do that. Don't ignore it. Don't cold shoulder it for days. We, we've counseled people like this before where they, they leave it for days. I'm telling you, it's not healthy. And maturity, this is another childlike versus childish. How many of you know children are very quick to forgive? Oh, it's okay, mom. Childish is drama, middle school. That's childish. Oh, I'm just not going to talk to you. Childish, spiritually mature Christians, born again believers, we shouldn't be like that. We should be mature enough to have a conversation with someone in love to restore back the relationship. And if it's up to me, I'm going to do everything. I can't control what someone else decides, I can't control what they do. But as far as for me, I can determine in my heart and I can do everything within my power to help restore that. Right? Okay, so um, we saw there that um, your prayers can be hindered. Your prayers can be hindered if we're holding on to, to bitterness and unforgiveness. So what do we need to do before we come, before we stand praying, we forgive. And you know what? It's so simple. You know what's so simple? It's just an act of forgiveness from your heart. And you just, you can come up 
You can be in your car driving. You can be wherever. And the Holy Spirit prompts you to say, you need to forgive that person. And you know what? All it takes is, Lord, I forgive them. Three words. Four words. Lord, I forgive them. And you know what? Don't think because you have feelings that say otherwise that you didn't do it. Because the enemy will surely come. Something will happen where it wants to flare it up again. And you know what you answer that with? I already forgave them. I already forgave them. I'm not allowing that. I already forgave them, and I love them. We don't go by feelings. We go by what the word says, right? And we forgive. Okay, on the other topic of forgiveness... Forgiving yourself. How many of you know sometimes the enemy wraps us up because we, we have a hard time overlooking our own faults and our own mess-ups? But how many of you know forgiving others also includes you? Forgiving yourself. If you don't forgive yourself, it will hinder your faith as much as unforgiveness toward another person will hinder your faith. So how many of you know it's important to forgive ourselves? And you know what the enemy wants to do? Bring up the past. That accuser wants to come and paint pictures of your past. Paint, paint pictures of what you did or didn't do or how you responded and you shouldn't have or what you said and you shouldn't have said that or you shouldn't have done that. And you know what that does? That hinders your faith. But you know what you can say? Lord, I forgive myself because I know you've forgiven me. And don't let the enemy paint those pictures of past that keep you in bondage. So he's trying to keep you out of the presence of God to keep you from the flow that God wants to give you. How many of you know if you're ate up with guilt and condemnation, you have a hard time coming to God? But God wants us free from that. And we read this earlier, but um, Isaiah 43, 25 and 26 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Aren't you thankful for that? That he's blotted it out. He doesn't remember it. That means it's under the blood of Jesus. It's washed away. That means truly, if you said, Lord, but do you remember when I, he would say, nope. So you can remind the enemy of this verse when he tries to bring up guilt and condemnation from your past. You know, from, I, you know, he comes with all sorts of ways. You're not a good mom. You're not a good dad. You, this or that, or you messed up here. Or you always do this. No, that's under the blood of Jesus. I'm free. Free from guilt, free from condemnation. So don't allow him to accuse you. Philippians 3, 12 through 14, and this is Paul talking. He said, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what do we see? Paul had to forgive himself. Sometimes we overlook that, but he murdered Christians. And what does it say? Not that I'm perfected. But he, he says, I, don't, I have to forget the past so that I can move forward. So what did Paul even have to do? He had to receive God's forgiveness for him. Because if he didn't, he wouldn't have fulfilled the call that God had on his life. It would have kept him in bondage. But you know what he had to do? He had to forget, and then he had to move forward. So you know, you're able to forget by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the love of God that's greater than guilt and condemnation. Did you know that? The love of God is greater than that. So you can forget and you can move forward. And then one of the other areas, um, so it can affect our prayer life, but you know, it can also affect your health. Unforgiveness, resentment, 
bitterness. Have you ever met someone who's a, like a bitter, resentful person? It doesn't take long before you realize because it shows all over. And how many of you know there's actually health problems and things associated with holding on to unforgiveness and bitterness? And I want to read, um, I want to encourage you, um, and I tell our staff and leaders this, but Love the Way to Victory, this is by um, Kenneth E. Hagan. I encourage you, get this book and keep it on hand. I call it my perennial, which means I read it every year. It's important, and it's so, so good. And he has so many stories in here that I'm just like, wow. Just the amount of the love of God that was working in him. And I say love of God in him because he, he learned how to tap it and cultivate it. And I was listening to him, and he talked about when he was 17 years old, and he um, was going and just preaching, and it was during the Depression, and he said he, I think he said J.C. Penney had, like, three different classifications of shoes, like, what was it, good, good, better, best, or something, and in price ranges, you know. And he said, I could never afford the best, but I could afford the good, so I got, like, three pairs of them. And he said how he, weared out, he wore out his shoes, you know, um, just going and preaching. But he said, I remember walking on that dusty road, in worn down shoes, and I remember telling the Lord, I will always walk in love. I'm making a determined purpose to always walk in love. And, um, you know, it, it just blessed me because we saw it. And um, we were there the last year that he um, ministered at Bible school, and we were in his class. And um, Pastor Nate and I, we were funny. We got to sit in the very front row, and all of our friends were like jealous. How'd you get the front row? I'm like, I don't know. God just loves us. Um, But we got in the front row, and so every day we'd try to walk out because he he was pretty, like, methodical in when he would walk in and when he'd walk out. And so we'd always want to walk out just so we could walk by, you know, like, be by him when he'd walk out. And um, every and part of it was because of the love of God, truly. You, I mean, we would just be in awe, like he would walk by and you could just sense the love of God. And I just remember thinking, I want to be a person like that. Where the love of God is just so on display. Where people don't, don't notice other things besides, they just love well. You know, if that could be said in our homes, if that could be said in our church family, they just love well. What a beautiful picture I don't even know why I'm crying. We just talked about this last night in our house. Goodness. <clears throat> I said I don't cry except for when I'm on stage. And then the boys were saying, telling Nate how much he cries when he ministers. Because he was saying, I don't cry. And then we're all like. <laughs> <laughs> I know. He said, but only, he said, I said, well, only on the stage. And he said, I don't even do it that much. And Samuel's like, dad, you do it like every week. <laughs> He said not every week, and anyways, we were doing like 7 out of 10, 4 out of 10, whatever. I think we got down to 4 out of 10, 5 out of 10. I said, well, I guess pretty much me every time. I'm not a crier, but it's the state. It's the anointing. It's the love of God. Okay, so I just wanted to read just a couple things um, shut that. out of um, this book. Sorry, let me find it. Um, give me one second. Okay, he says this. Um, you see, sometimes by listening to the word, people get to the root cause and find out where they are missing it in their faith connection. And a lot of times they are missing it in this area of walking in love and forgiveness. Over the years, I've noticed that those folks who listen to the word and respond to it by making the necessary adjustment in their heart are the ones who receive their healing. Only a small percentage of people receive healing who only go to one meeting, don't get into the word for themselves, and don't make any needed changes. For example, a woman came to my wife and me after a meeting once and said, I've had stomach trouble and a respiratory problem for some time. 
I decided to go to every one of your services and get in the healing line at the end of the week. She had already been to um, almost every leading healing evangelist in America at that time, but had not been healed. This woman said, toward the end of the week, I began to realize that before I could get into the healing line and expect God to do something for me, I was going to have to get my heart right by calling my brother to ask him to forgive me. She went on to explain to my wife and me that she and her brother had had a disagreement 25 years before. They had not spoken to each other since, yet they both claimed to be Christians. This woman checked up on the inside and realized, oh, thank you. Um, this woman checked up on the inside and realized she still harbored resentment and unforgiveness against her brother from something that had happened 25 years earlier. She had recently been filled with the Holy Spirit, but she had been saved for many years. If she had been listening to her spirit, the Holy Ghost would have led her to reconcile with her brothers years before. Sometimes it takes some people a long time to change, but it doesn't have to. They could change sooner if they would just learn to walk in love. Anyway, she called her brother long distance and said, I just want to call and ask you to forgive me. I was wrong. See how simple that is? He said, I'm so glad you called. I was thinking about calling you. You weren't to blame. I was. I've been intending to call you to ask you to forgive me. They each finally agreed to take 50% of the blame. <laughs> she told him, sorry. She told him that after the meeting, she was going to fly to New York to visit him. She told me later that after she got things right with her brother, she felt a deep sense of peace and well-being on the inside. She lay down to take a nap before the evening service. Later, she told my wife and me, when I woke up, I couldn't find a trace of any kind of sickness. I mean, every symptom and every pain completely disappeared. She said, I've never felt so good in all my life. All my stomach problems have disappeared, and so have my lung problems. She said, I came all the way down here to the meeting, and I never did get in the healing line, but when I forgave my brother and got things straightened out with him, I got healed. The moment she started walking in love, she could claim God's promises about healing. Over a period of many years, I've had person after person tell me the same thing. They had to forgive someone and get the situation straightened out before they could receive their healing. Some of them were even terminal cases. One man told me, my doctor said, you'll be dead in 30 days. The man just made the necessary adjustments in his heart by getting rid of every bit of ill will, animosity, and unforgiveness, and he's healed and still alive today. I never did have to pray for him or lay hands on him. Think about that. He was healed of terminal cancer when he exercised forgiveness. In more than half a century of ministry, I've dealt with thousands of people who needed healing. Not all at one time, of course, but I'm talking about dealing with six people on a one-to-one -one basis over a period of many years. I've known people who got in the healing lines of nearly every leading evangelist of the day and still did not get well. Especially in days gone by when they were healing revivals everywhere. Then I've seen those same people make a trip to the prayer room and get their heart right with God. Then you didn't even have to pray for them. <clears throat> Excuse me, their illnesses disappeared completely. Um, he said, I've been in the healing ministry for nearly 60 years, and I know from experience that so many Christians fail to receive their healing because they're unwilling to straighten things up with others. They are unwilling to rid their heart of anything that isn't right with God. Sometimes they need to forgive someone else, but sometimes they need to forgive themselves. Some folks will, will forgive others, but not themselves. But they have to forgive themselves, too, in order to walk in health. So can we have the um, band come up? Sorry, I'm going to take a drink real quick. Everyone can just stand. Um, there's another one that I didn't read, but um, <clears throat> this was of someone who said that she hated her mother-in-law, <laughs> and um, he talked to he talked to her, and um, she just said, and she was actually a pastor of a of a church, and he said, so you know this is something that isn't we're not immune to it. 
in the, in the lives of anyone. It's a choice to walk in love. And anyway, so she was saying, I, I hate my mother-in-law, I hate my mother-in-law. And he told her, you, when you say that, he said, now say that again. And he, they were sitting at, at, at dinner. She said, I hate my mother-in-law. And he said, when you say that, what, what happens when you say that? She said, well, there's something there that kind of just doesn't feel right. And he said, that's the love of God wanting to come out. And so he talked to her about just the love of God and practicing the love of God and forgiving. And eventually she did, and, and she forgave. And they came over to, um, I think she called her mother-in-law and called her a couple of her sisters-in-law and anyway, had everyone over for dinner. And then she asked Brother Hagen, would you come over for dinner with us and join us? And um, so he said most of the time, you know, sometimes I, he'd get a lot of that, but he said, the Lord told me you need to go. And so he gave her, um, he said, as I was driving there, he said, the Lord um, just gave me a scripture for her and what I was supposed to tell her. And um, she had, I think, I don't know if it was a daughter, I think maybe a daughter or granddaughter that was dealing with like epileptic seizures. And the doc specialist doctor said out of all the cases he'd ever seen, this one was the worst. And so Brother Hagen came and um, this this lady was there and he shared the scripture with her about loving and all that, whatever the Lord told him to tell her. And um, she, he told her, you go over to your daughter, granddaughter, whoever it was, and I want you to say, devil, you take your hands off of my daughter. I walk in love. This family walks in love. And um, so she walked over and the daughter was having a seizure at the time. And she walked over and she said, Devil, you take your hands off my family. We walk in love. And you know she had been making steps toward that. And immediately the seizure stopped. And she never dealt with it again. And they actually said later on that she ended up being like super brilliant and went on to do things and actually came to his meetings and stuff later on, that little girl. So what the enemy was trying to do was not just steal the destiny of that mom, but she was, he was trying to steal the destiny of that family. And so this is why it's so important not letting strife in our homes. It, it causes symptoms. It can cause it. And I'm not saying that the only reason someone's sick is because they have bitterness or unforgiveness. I'm just saying this is one of the ways. And you'll know the Holy Spirit will prompt you to say, forgive that person. And you know how many people's lives and bodies have been saved by, that they didn't even know about simply by forgiving and because of loving? And so if we could just dim the lights, if you don't mind. I just saw this as we, um, just everyone close your eyes this morning. And I saw this, we'll just take a couple minutes here. And I just saw this in praying and over the service that... Um, if you've been dealing with unforgiveness or resentment or, um, and it could be, you know, for unforgiveness towards someone else, it could be toward yourself. Um, and you're needing healing. Um, you're needing healing in your body, in your mind. I just saw opening up the altar and I just want to encourage you, you know, we talked about cultivating love and we talked about how unforgiveness can hinder Stepping outside of love can hinder your faith. It can hinder your prayers. It can hinder health in your body and in your mind. And so, you know, there's always, like we talked about, there's always an action. We're always to put action to our faith. And so I just saw that this morning, that your action and your action is to come forward and to just come before the Lord at the altar <clears throat> and I don't want you to be embarrassed. It's not, this is freeing. This is freeing. So if that's you this morning, I want you to come forward as an act of faith saying, you know, I've dealt with bitterness and unforgiveness. I've dealt with resentment. It may be for years. It may be for a week. It may be, but it's something that you've been struggling. And I just believe as you come forward that the anointing is going to do the work in you. The anointing is going to do the work. And for some of you, you've been hindered. I sense that 
with symptoms in your body and it's simply you just need to forgive. It's tied to letting it, something go, whether it's forgiving yourself, whether it's forgiving someone else. And if, that, if that's you, I want you to come forward and I want you to close your eyes. And this is between you and God. This isn't between me and you. This is between you and God. And you know what? We're going to, with our mouths, because how many of you know faith is released through words? So you made the step to come forward this morning, but now we're going to take another step and we're going to release our faith through words. And you know, words steer your life, words direct your life. And I believe every one of you are up here and every one of you are going to walk away free. Because what did, we, what did we read about this morning that God says, he doesn't remember, he doesn't remember. And you know what? Unfortunately, you know who does remember? People remember sometimes. But you know what? When people want to bring it up, when the devil wants to bring it up, you can just remind him, Lord, nothing's more important than your word over me. And your word over me says that I'm released, I'm forgiven, that my sin's been removed as far as the east is from the west, that you've forgiven me greatly so I can forgive others. I can let you heal my heart. He's so great at healing hearts. So everybody, let's just say this with our own mouths. And if you're up front, I want you to just lift your hands. That's just an act of surrender to the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And I want you to, we're going to use our words. I want you to picture who you need to forgive. If it's yourself, if it's others, if it's more than one person, I want you to picture them. In your, in your heart. And then I want you to say this, Lord, I forgive them. Say it again, Lord, I forgive them. Now I want you to just see you release them. Just release them. Release that situation, release that person. And Lord, we just apply the blood of Jesus over each and every person here in Jesus' name. We thank you freedom in this house. We thank you for healing in bodies in the name of Jesus. Is there anyone up front here that needed healing? Was there anyone? If you'll raise your hand, I just want to lay my hands on you if you need healing. Is there anyone? You? Thank you, Lord. We thank you healing in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Healing, freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom in Jesus' name. Released. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Healing in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Broken. That assignment broken in the name of Jesus. Broken in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Healing in Jesus' name. Healing in Jesus' name. Freedom. <laughs> yeah, he thought he had you. He thought he had you. You're free. You're free. Free to run, free to do all he's called you to do. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. The call of God. The call of God. The call of God. Thank you, Lord. No longer bound no longer bound in Jesus name thank you Lord thank you Lord in Jesus name freedom in Jesus name freedom in Jesus name loosed loosed and let go <laughs> yeah joy 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 in all he's called you to do joy oh thank you Lord broken <clears throat> oppression and depression broken in the name of Jesus freedom freedom thank you Lord freedom in Jesus name freedom in the name of Jesus <laughs> joy joy oh thank you Lord no longer held no longer held no longer held you're free you're free in Jesus name freedom in Jesus name 
Thank you, Lord. Freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom. Freedom. Thank you, Lord. Loved. You're loved and valued. You're loved and valued. You're loved and valued. And he sees you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Freedom. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Blessed. Blessed. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. In Jesus' name. Bless. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to lay my hands on everyone. Thank you, Lord. Freedom in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And I just heard you watch who you listen to. You watch who you listen to. You guard the gates. Thank you, Lord. Guard those gates. You know what they are. Freedom. There's a source there. And once you shut the door to that source, to that voice, you'll see clear again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, healing. Healing. Thank you, Lord. Healing in Jesus' name. Healing in Jesus' name. Yeah, what the many enemy meant for evil, he's turning around for your good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, the joy, the joy, <laughs> the joy. Thank you, Lord. Freed, freedom, freedom, <laughs> freedom. Yeah, love never fails. <laughs> love never fails. You just keep loving. You just keep loving. It never fails. It never fails. Thank you, Lord love of God, the love of God. Thank you, Jesus, the love of God, the love of God. Thank you, Lord, penetrating. Yeah, you just release that. You just release that. Mm. What's been holding you no longer. Free in Jesus' name. Free in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Forgiven and free. That's your testimony. Forgiven and free. Forgiven and free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Yeah, you can. Through him, you can do all things. Through him, you can do all things. Through him, you can do all things. Say, I can. I can. I can forgive. <laughs> Released in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Broken. Broken off. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just lift our hands to him this morning. Oh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Released. Released. Mm, there's a peace there. There's a peace there now. And you watch. You watch God begin to move on your behalf. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. It's a faith thing. It's a faith thing. You can. You can. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Not on how you feel, not on what it looks like, but by my spirit, says the Lord by my spirit, freedom, freedom there, <laughs> freedom there, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, freedom in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, all that's held you, released in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, peace, peace, thank you, Jesus, peace in the name of Jesus.
want you, if you're up here, just to say, I'm free. <clears throat> I'm free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, there's something in our home. Um, you know, we're, we've are we been married for 21 years, going on 22 uh, this year. But in our home, I, I'm thankful for uh, just the intuition and I'd call it the Holy Spirit, but like a woman's intuition that she'll be like, hey, you think everything's okay with so-and-so? Maybe you should talk to them. Maybe you should, you know, and so many times we just, you know, guys, we can just be like, whoop. And I even think, I, I'm just so blessed even in, in, in uh, not only doing life at home, but doing life in the house that you'll, you'll make a, make, you take time to check in with what's going on and that's what this is about you know anyway so thank you Lord thank you Lord Father we thank you for your love we thank you for love in this house love in our homes love in our hearts and we just say with our mouths we choose to yield to your love we choose love I choose love just tell them I choose love in my home today and tomorrow and the next day Holy Spirit remind me of your love and I can yield to it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you guys be blessed. Happy, have a happy Mother's Day. I know the ushers have some yep, gifts. Yep, we have little door. treat bags for you. So don't forget, get your pictures with your moms. Love on your moms. Have a great day. We love y'all.